today we have the first lecture on Bode plots. We started this in the last lecture when you defined the uh, magnitude and phase of transfer functions. And the objective today is to represent that in a uh, graph that is easy to understand. It has all the information about the system's frequency response. That's the purpose of the Bode plot. So this is not an easy lecture, I have to, to say. Uh, students tend to struggle with this a little bit. So let's take this slowly. We don't need to go through everything today. We can continue in the next lecture if needed. The key is, if anything is not clear, ask me, and I will repeat that as many times as needed, because the subsequent lecture will be based on what we see today. So if anything today is not clear, the next lecture is not going to make sense. So make sure to just stop me and ask questions if anything uh, is not clear. Some of you may have seen body plots before in electronics and in, uh, in other classes. Uh, but today, the objective is to construct them rather than just analyzing them, is to look at a transfer function and then based on the transfer function, come up with a Bode plot. And another thing that I want to be very clear today is what the... Uh, what is the um, interpretation of a Bode plot? What exactly, what, what information does a Bode plot display and why is that useful? So that's the, the objective of this lecture and the next lecture, lecture 22, where we're going to see the second part of body plots. And this will be one of the last contents. Uh, we'll post an assignment on Monday after that lecture. And then uh, that's, of course, the last assignment because that will be our pretty much our last uh, lecture. Okay, so again, if anything is not clear, feel free to, to ask. If you're having issues at uh, home with... Um, the video quality, use the shared content. Typically that's a bit better. But you can also pin my image or try to share content to one of those. Uh, typically works better than the other. Uh, the video quality today is not, it's not good. I contact the IT several times, they are looking into it. So by the end of today, today's lecture, the idea is to understand the concept of body plots, how to read, a body plot, what information we get there, and determine how poles and zeros will affect the body plot, will affect the frequency response of a system. And then, of course, represent everything in a body plot. We addressed this in the last lecture. We had this mechanical system with a motor that applies a force to a, to a mass. And we saw that uh, depending on the frequency we give to this motor, depending on how fast we want it to change direction, it may reach a lower or higher speed in position, that, and that depends on how much time we give the motor uh, to go in one direction and another. So if we first give this motor this square wave form, so back to the next lecture, and we watch what we get in the output in the system, we see that if this frequency is sufficiently low, the system will reach a steady state, and then we will reverse the speed, reach a steady state again, reverse the speed, and so on. But as soon as we start decreasing this frequency, excuse me, increasing this frequency, that is, we make this change faster, we can see that as we do that, the time the motor takes to spin in one direction is, is, is limited. It will have to stop here. So you're not really reaching a steady state. We are at a lower value than a steady state because now the dynamics of the system are coming in the way. It's too fast. And now when you reverse the speed, the same thing happens. We go to a lower value of the speed and we repeat the cycle. The greater the frequency, the shorter that a period is, the smaller the maximum speed of the motor is. Right. On the other hand, if we increase the frequency, it doesn't really matter past the frequency where the system is able to reach a steady state. If you, what is gonna happen is, if we increase the frequency, let's say we have something that is much longer like that, like twice the period, we are simply going to stay at the maximum steady state speed. All right, so if we decrease the frequency, the maximum speed does not change because it's always limited by friction in the system. Right? Friction times the speed itself is the reaction force we get from the mass. And that will at one point balance out the input force. So if we plot the maximum speed as a function of the frequency, which is the graph we see here, 
this is frequency, we should see something like that, a flat line that at one point it starts to decrease. And it starts to decrease because now the dynamics of the system will come in the way. And what do we get from this graph? Well, this graph is telling us that if I want the system to go at a, this frequency to reach this specific speed, I will have to apply a certain voltage to it. And provided that the system can handle that, we, we can determine which voltage the system or which force in this particular case the system needs in order to reach the displacement or the speed we want at that particular frequency. That's what the, this graph is telling us. We can do the same analysis for position, but for position, the thing is, uh, is a bit different because now the greater the time the motor has to spin, the farther it will. It doesn't reach a plateau anymore. We are looking now at something that always increases over time with an exponential like that, always increases over time and keeps going. It's basically just spinning one way, spinning the other way. I said there is no upper bound. The more time we give to it, the more it spins. The less time we give to it, the less it spins. And if you now plot the maximum displacement, we should see something like this. We should see a curve that it decreases with frequency because as we increase the frequency, we give it less time to spin. At some point, at the same point where the speed changed, this slope shall also change because now the dynamics of the system will get in the way. I said there are two effects here the, uh, that we will see later where these are coming from. But what do we get from this graph again? Well, if this graph gives us the ratio between the input force and the resulting speed, we can look at the graph and, say, and, and infer what force we need in order to reach a given position for a given frequency. Think about an assembly line once again where a robot is picking something in one place and um, and placing that somewhere else. Depending on how fast we want that emotion to occur, we will have to look at this graph that will tell us how much voltage the robot arm will, will take to be able to accomplish that. Because if, the, if we basically increase the voltage, what is going to do here? We are going to shift this plot up upwards. All right, we are delivering more power to the system, provided that it is a linear system. The more power we give to it, the greater the final speed, the greater the final velocity, the uh, final position. So by increasing the voltage, we can shift this graph up and down. And this tells us exactly what voltage we need to achieve a certain speed or position in, uh, at, at a given frequency. Okay. So that's the information you get from a body plot. This, this graph is the first one if you're dealing with the ratios between the input and output, that's just a way to normalize it. So the graph is independent of the magnitude of the input. And another piece that you're going to add today is the frequency, um, frequency dependent phase shift. And what does the phase shift mean? Well, the phase shift is, is how aligned the input and the output are. If you're dealing, let's go back to this example here. If you're dealing with that, at the peak of the force, the, the motor may be going at a peak speed in the same direction as the force. But that not, may not necessarily occur if we start to increase the frequency because there is inertia in the way. So even if we, the motor, let's say, accelerated the mass to the, to the what is this? The, um, what do you call it? To the right. No, this is the right. Yeah, that's the right. And then the force uh, all of a sudden switches to the left the motor has some inertia. So it will keep going, even though the force is pointing in the opposite direction. And then eventually we will start to move this way, but there is a delay between the time you shift the force and the time the motor changes direction. And that's the phase shift. That's the phase shift between the input and output. And that's really important as a way, another way to characterize how the system behaves. So that's another piece of information that we can get from the transfer functions and from the body plots. Okay. This, this video here that has the complete explanation of what we just discussed. If, you, uh, if anything is not clear, please take a look at it here at, at this video. It's a 10 minutes long and it explains 
that a mass system in more detail. Okay, so go back. Well, let's go back to the last lecture. We we covered this there. But just a brief reminder, we don't need to do this analysis all the time. We don't need to calculate the time response of the system all the time in order to determine the maximum speed or maximum position or whatever we are trying to analyze. Why? Because if the input to the system is a sinusoidal waveform, so is the output. And that's why when you're dealing with body plots, you're not using square waveforms as I used there. That was just to make it easier. We are using sinusoidal waveforms because that's the only waveform that when passed through a linear time invariant system produces a, uh, a output of same shape and same frequency in the output. So all the analysis we're going to do here, we'll assume that the input is a sinusoidal waveform. And if you want to determine what is the magnitude of the output, once again, we don't need to redo all this calculation all the time because we know that the output is also a sinusoidal waveform having the same frequency as the input, but it has a phase shift compared to the input and it has a magnitude change, M. So if our input signal here is A sine of omega zero T, where omega uh, A is this magnitude there, then the output of the system is Y of T, A times M sine of omega zero T plus phi. We see that the output has the same frequency as the input. We have A as the magnitude of the input there, and we have M, that's the scaling factor that it now comes from the transfer function. And that scaling factor can be easily calculated, as we did in the last lecture, by simply finding the real and imaginary parts of the transfer function, taking the square root of the, uh, the sum of the squares there. And that's M, that's the magnitude of the transfer function. And this is one piece of information that we can take from a body plot. Right? That's what we just drew here. This would be that M, that a normalized M. The other thing is that a phi that appears in the, the sign here, this phi is the phase shift. And the phase shift is nothing else than the phase of the transfer function itself. And you can calculate that by finding the real and imaginary part of the transfer function. Take the inverse tangent of the imaginary divided by the real part. You can see now that both the magnitude and the phase are frequency dependent. And what we are doing in the Bode plot, again, is to just represent them in a graphical, uh, graphical way. If you buy any electronic component, you will see a body plot in there. If you buy an operation amplifier, it comes with a body plot of its uh, behavior there. If you buy a, a voice coil actuator for your robotics project, you will see a body plot included as well. And that body plot is all you need to know at what freq frequency range this uh, specific piece of equipment is meant to operate at. So there's a reason why this is in every data sheet. Pretty much. Let's go back to this example we did in the last lecture. If we want to find the phase and magnitude of this transfer function of or the system, we know that let's just look at the uh, this time here, just at the frequency representation. We can find the relation between the output and output. That's two plus one over s. We replace s with omega j to evaluate the phase and magnitude as a function of frequency. What happens to sigma again? Why is S now omega j, now omega j plus sigma? Because sigma creates transients, create exponential waveforms. Transients, we are dealing with steady state. We don't care about the transients, so sigma can be set to zero. And through this, we can find the phase and magnitude. We did this in the last lecture. I'm not going to repeat it here, but we can now plot the real and imaginary parts. If you take, if you look here, we have the real part is two. The imaginary part is negative one over omega. And this is the magnitude and phase of transfer function. Here we have the magnitude and here we have phase. 
So we can see now that these are frequency dependent. If the frequency tends to zero, what happens to the magnitude? If the frequency tends to zero, what happens to the magnitude? Does it go to infinity or go to zero? If the frequency tends to zero. It goes to infinity, right? Because you have negative one over omega. If omega is very small, then you have a negative and infinite number. Uh, the magnitude, the size of that vector tends to infinity. And what happens to the phase? Tends to Phase tends to negative 90 degrees. Yeah, downwards, so negative 90 degrees. Very good. If the frequency tends to infinity, what happens to the magnitude? Goes to zero. And what happens to the, uh, the magnitude goes to two. Excuse me, goes to two because now the vector just goes back to back up. And what happens to the phase? Goes to zero. Phase goes to zero. So the phase and magnitude are frequency dependent. So we could plot them in a graph like this. We have two graphs. The y uh, axis is the magnitude and the phase. And the z, the uh, x axis here is the frequency in radians per second. So here we are starting to see something that is getting close to a body plot, but not quite there. Uh, all I did was to take this function here, make omega go from something close to zero to, uh, to what, to 10, something like that, in radians per second, evaluate the phase and magnitude and plot the result there. There's a problem with this representation because we see that, uh, well, indeed, as the frequency goes from zero to 10, you see the phase going from negative 90 to zero, as we predicted. And we see the magnitude going from plus infinity to um, two, setting, settling at two. But the problem with this is that all the information is kind of in this area here. It's really hard to see. That's pretty much when th where things are, are happening and everything else is kind of, you know, kind of looks like it's useless because that's the portion where most of the information is. So to kind of stretch this area and uh, have a better understanding of what is going on there, we are going to use a log scale. Instead of plotting the real number uh, that we got from the calculation, we're just going to do log of 20 log, sorry, log of log 10 of the magnitude. And this is what do we see here? Log 10 of the magnitude. And let's do the same for the frequency. Let's do the same for the frequency. Uh, instead of looking at the, 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 the uh, a regular frequency scale, let's also put the frequency in a logarithmic scale. So instead of representing this from two to 10, we're going to go from powers of 10. So what you see in the denominator here, in, oh, not the denominator, in the x axis are the powers of 10. So the first one here is 10 to the power of negative two. Second one is 10 to the power of uh, negative 1.5, 10 to the power of negative one, and so on. So between each of these labels here, we have a factor of 10 in frequency. That's what we're going to call today a decay one decay in frequency. So both axes are in this log scale. And why are we doing this again? Because you see the difference between them. The information is a lot more visible in the second one because you're kind of stretching the changes. We are highlighting where things are changing in the body plot. Uh, and here, all the information is pretty much lost in that, that uh, short graph there. Okay, so that's the idea. We're gonna use log 10 for both axes. So there's a, a, a little, uh, another change here. So the magnitude, we are not going to simply do log 10 of that because that would be too trivial. Let's complicate things a bit more. And instead we are going to use the decibel scale. And we're going to represent the magnitude of the transfer function as 
20 log 10 of the magnitude. So if you found the magnitude m, we're going to do 20 log of m, and that's this axis here. Where does that come from? Well, this is the decibel scale, and this comes from the um, Bell Labs when they were uh, working on the phone, on the first phones, we the, the minimum detectable signal at the time that it could send between uh, phone lines was exactly 20 log of something. That was the minimum, and what that something was the minimum signal they could produce. And it comes from, we inherited it from that time. It is just a convention. It's nothing more than a convention. The key really is that a both is, uh, axes here are logarithmic scales. But as conventionally used, you're going to use the decibel scale for the magnitude. And therefore, we have to multiply that by 20. All right? But again, we inherited that from the phone era. We still use it. And it's now just the standard practice. So if we see something on the magnitude axis here, let's say this number 9, what, does the, what is the actual magnitude of the transfer function? Well, how did we get 9? We got 20 log 10 of the magnitude, and that was equal to 9. That's what we plotted. So what is m? Well, we can have log 10 of m equals to 9 over 10. So m is 10 to the power of 9, oh, sorry, uh, 9 over 20 is 9 over 20. So that's the actual magnitude of the transfer function in a known decibel scale. Right? But we took 20 log of that, and that's what we plotted here. Okay. And again, the frequency here is represented in a logarithmic scale. So if we have, let's say, 1, this is 10 to the power of 0. That's 1 radians per second. And here we have 10 to the power of 1. That's 10 radians per second. And because this is a log scale, we should see, this is a bit misleading. It shouldn't be like that. We would have, for example, two here, three, four, five, six, seven. These are, uh, uh, oh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. It's not linear. It's not a linear scale anymore, right? And that's what makes uh, the, the graph interesting. Okay, so that, that's a body plot now. That's the phase and the magnitude of the transfer function as a function of frequency. The only difference here is they're going to use the decibel scale for the magnitude. We're going to use phase in degrees as traditionally done. And then the frequency axis itself is also in a log scale. Any questions? Yeah, so uh, this is a, it's not a linear scale anymore. Right. So these are powers of 10. So when you're plotting this thing, and if you look at where the ticks are there, it's not linear anymore. They are not equally spaced because it's a log scale. They are compressed towards 10, towards one. So they're going to be something I don't know, an approximation, something like this. The distance between them gets smaller and smaller because it's, it's just not linear anymore, right? Any other questions? No questions from home, no? Okay, sure. All right, and that's, that's the body plot. That's all what you need to know about it. But how do we build this body plot? Well, we don't need to calculate everything we calculated before every time. There are some shortcuts here you can take. So let's consider the generic transfer function in equation two. That's simply a ratio of zeros and poles, several zeros multiplied together, divided by several poles multiplied together times a gain k, constant gain k. If you want to find the magnitude of the transfer function, you are now dealing with decibels. So you're taking 20 log of that. Right? We are going to refer now to the magnitude in decibel scale as a gain. 
So if we go back to the body plot, the first plot here is the gain. And the second one is simply the phase. Right? We'll refer to that when you use the log, 20 log of it. So now simply evaluate, simply evaluating 20 log of that function. But now we have 20 log of a ratio of two, uh, um, two polynomials. We can use a log property that states that a log A times B equals to log A plus log B. And you can also say that a log A divided by B equals to log A minus log B. That's a property of the logarith logarithmic function. When we can also use another one later, log of A times to the power of N is the same as N times log of A. A reminder that these are just properties of the logarithmic operation operator. So because of that, now this is, a, this is good news because you can split the equation in three into a sum of different logs. We have three elements there. We have the constant gain K. We have poles and we have zeros. According to the identity we just established there, we can always split this function, this fraction into sums of logs. And that's equation four. The first one is 20 log of a gain, not gain K. The second one is log of all zeros. And the second one is for that of all poles. All right. This could be also written as negative sum of I2 uh, equals to one N 20 log of J omega plus PI. I'm uh, just moving that upward, uh, upstairs. We have the negative power of negative one that goes to the front according to one of the properties. That's the, the same way. So what am I getting from this? Well, this is good news because it means that to get the body plot of the entire transfer function, all we need is to know these elementary building blocks and then add everything together. If we know the body plot of a constant gain, of a pole and a zero, we can find the body plots of these individual elements, these individual building blocks, and then add everything together. And why can we add them together? Because of the log property stating that the log of a, b equals to log a plus log b. Right. So that's the main message here in equation four. If we know the body plot of elementary building blocks, we know the body plot of the entire transfer function. You just have to add them up. What are these building blocks? Poles, zeros, and constant gains. That's all. And so that's what we're going to focus on now, is to find a way to analyze in the, the, these building blocks, a pole and a zero and a, a gain. And then once we have that, we can simply add everything together. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. So. Let's start with the simplest one, uh, which will be a constant gain. But before I for, uh, forgot I had this slide here, we also need to look at the phase. And the phase is the same thing we, we saw before. The phase of the transfer function is the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. But for a system with multiple poles and zeros, we can simply add the phase of all poles, subtract the phase of all I add the phase of all zeros and subtract the sum of the phases of all poles. And that gives the phase of the entire transfer function. So same thing, if you know the phase of poles and zeros, just add everything together with the respective, the, the appropriate signs. And that shall give us the phase of the entire transfer function. So let's just start with the first uh, building block here, which is the constant gain. In this case, g of s equals to k, that's the transfer function. What we have is just a real part. There's no imaginary component. We can place k here. We see the phase and we see the magnitude. The magnitude in decibels is simply 20 log of k for all frequencies. That's uh, so what this sign is saying, 20 log of k for all frequencies. 
what is the phase? Well, the phase can be either zero degrees or 180 degrees or negative 180 degrees. It's the same. If we place, if you have a negative K, so if G of S is negative K, then K would be placed on this side here. Magnitude is still the same as 20 log of K. That doesn't change. It's 20 log of K. Uh, the magnitude of K is still the same. And now the phase can be either 180 degrees or negative 180 degrees. That's the same. Right? So just a way to see it from above or below. Uh, that's exactly the same. So on a body plot, what should we see? Well, we should see a constant horizontal line that is simply 20 log of K. That's for the magnitude. What about the phase? Well, the phase is going to be either zero or 180 degrees. And it's also going to be a constant line. There is no frequency. The frequency does not affect that. Okay. So that's the first building block. Now let's look at the second one. Second one is a pole at the origin. If we have a pole at the origin, we have G of S equals to one over S, which is the same as one over J omega. The magnitude is one over omega. We can now take 20 log of that. So 20 log of one over omega is the same as 20 log of one minus 20 log of omega. 20 log of one is Log of 10, log 10 of one is zero. All right, so we are left with negative 20 log of omega. Now we see something interesting here is 20 log of omega. Omega is present. The magnitude depends on the frequency. What is the phase? Well, the phase is the example we had before. We just had negative one over omega. It's a purely imaginary component. So depending on omega, we see the magnitude changing, the size of that vector increasing or decreasing, but the phase does not change. The function always lies on the imaginary axis, negative imaginary axis, and therefore the phase is always negative 90 degrees. Negative 90 degrees. So for a pole at the origin, what do we see? We see a phase that is constant at negative 90 degrees. That doesn't change for all frequencies. But what happens to the magnitude? Well, the magnitude is negative 20 log of omega. For every increase in omega by a factor of 10, the magnitude changes by negative 20 dB. If you have 20 log of 10, 20 log of one, that's zero. If you have a frequency of 10, that's negative 20. A frequency of 100, that's negative 40. 1,000, negative 60, and so on. Now remember that a 20 log of 1,000 is the same as negative 20 log of 10 to the power of three, which is the same as negative 60 log of 10 and log of 10 is one, All right? So for every increment in the frequency in a factor of 10, the body plot magnitude decreases by a factor of 20. And that's what you're going to see here at frequency of one radians per, uh, one radians per second, 20 log of one is zero. So this slope always passes by this point, passes at zero decibels, at one radians per second. And if we increase the frequency by a factor of 10, this is a factor of 10. Remember that this is 10 to the power of zero. This is 10 to the power of one. So between them here, there is a factor of 10. The magnitude is now negative 20. And if you go backwards, we are now decreasing the frequency by a factor of 10. The body plot goes up by 20 dB. And if you decrease the frequency one more decade to 10 to the power of negative two, it goes up by 20 dB. All right, so the pole at the origin results in a, a slope of negative 20 decibels per frequency decade. 
negative 20 decibels per frequency decay. So that means when the frequency increases by 10 times, the Bode plot goes down by 20 dB. And we, this Bode plot, the uh, pole of the origin now in, creates this slope, constant slope throughout the entire Bode plot, adds this slope of negative 20 dB per decade. Which makes me think about the example we just saw here. What was the, if you look back here, when you did the frequency, the speed, we had a transfer function something like this. It was something like that. And we saw this flat curve here that it was telling us, well, for a certain range of frequencies, the body plot is constant. But then when we did the speed, the position response, now our transfer function has changed to the integral of that. You see the one over S there, right? And look what happened here. That a flat line is no longer flat, it's now a slope, a constant slope. And where is that slope coming from? Well, it's coming from the integrator we just added. From position to speed, there is an integral. We have to multiply the function by one over S. And that a multiplication, that addition of the one over S resulted in, in, added, in this added slope of 20 dB per decade. And we see that that made this slope appear here that otherwise was just flat in the body plot, right? Let me go back to the example here. Any questions about the pole of the origin? No? Because it's clear or because it's, so you don't know what to ask? J omega, yeah. Right, so uh, because you're looking at the magnitude, right? So if the function is one over J omega and you're looking at the imaginary and the real components, this is the imaginary component. So you have the, the magnitude is the imaginary component squared plus the real part squared, square root, but there is no real component. Right, so it's the equivalent of just taking the magnitude of this because this is going to be squared anyways. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Any more questions? No? All right, so let's look at a zero at the origin. Now our function is simply g of s equals to s, which is the same as g omega. We are taking 20 log of that. That's easy, 20 log of omega. And if you plot the transfer function, we only have a imaginary component that is, uh, this should be omega, not one over omega. Please correct that. We see that now we only have an imaginary component, but the, it's positive. So the phase is always now plus 90 degrees. Plus 90 degrees. And look at the magnitude. The magnitude is 20 log of omega. What did we have for the pole? negative 20 log of omega. What did we have for the phase in the pole? Negative 90 degrees. So this is exactly the same as the pole, but with a sign change for both phase and magnitude. So in the pole, we had a slope that would decrease by 20 dB per decade. And here we have a slope that increases by 20 decibels per decade. For a frequency of one radians per second, we have zero. For a frequency of 10 radians per second, we have 20. 100, they have 40, and so on. So as we multiply the frequency by a factor of 10, the body plot goes up by a factor of 20. Same thing as the pole with a sign change. And look at the phase. Phase is the same as the pole. The pole was negative 90 degrees. Here we have positive 90 degrees, and phase is frequency independent. That's throughout the entire body plot. We can take this analysis one step further and consider multiple poles or multiple zeros at the origin. So in this case, we would have S to the power of N, 
n is an exponential. If n is positive, then you have zeros. And if n is negative, a negative integer, we have poles. All we have to do here is to multiply. We have uh, 20 log of omega to the power of n. n moves to the front. That's a property of the log. And then you have n times 20 log of omega. So this is to say that we are just multiplying the phase by n and the magnitude by n. Everything passes by zero, uh, by one radians per second, 10 to the power of zero and zero dB. And if you have one pole at the origin, it's a, it's a slope of negative 20 decibels per decade. If you have two poles at the origin, it's a slope of negative 40 decibels per decade. Three poles, negative 60. Zero is the same. One zero plus 20 dB per decade. Two zeros plus 40 dB per decade, and so on. And for the phase, one pole is negative 90, two poles, negative 180, three poles, negative 270, and so on. One zero plus 90, two zeros plus 180, three zeros plus 270, and so on. They're basically just multiplying both the slope and the phase by n. And you see this common intersection point. At 10 to the power of 0, we have 0 dB because we are dealing with 20 log of 10 to the power of 0. This is always uh, 0. They will cancel out. Yeah. They have the same number of poles and zeros. And it's basically just a, a gain left. Okay, any, any questions here? Yep. Same values. Well, what does it mean to have the same poles and zeros? If we have function g of s equals to, let's say, 10 times s to the power of 3 divided by s to the power of 3, these are, can, these are just going to cancel out. So this is 1. We are left with that. All right? We, what if we have s to the power of 4 here? Well, that's simply 1 over s. It's just one pole. You know, we just did the net number of poles and zeros. All right? Yes, the, the relative power difference between them. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, any other questions? No. Let's do an example and see how that feels like. So here we have a body uh, function ten over s. What can we do here? Well, the first thing, let's identify the elementary building blocks we need to deal with this function. Which building blocks do we have? A transfer, yeah. So which building blocks in that transfer function? We have a constant gain. That's 10. And what else? And a pole at the origin. A constant gain and the pole at the origin. So according to what we just saw, if we find the body plot of a pole at the origin and that of a gain, we can add them together to find the body plot of the entire function. So let's start with 10. That's a gain when you're dealing with the log scale, we're dealing with 20 log of 10. And this is plus 20 dB. On the body plot, what does that do? Well, it will just create a constant slope. Another constant slope, a constant line at 20. So this is 20 log of 10. What is the phase for that? The phase is... The phase is 
zero. That's a, just a constant gain. The phase is zero, it's a positive gain. Phase here is zero. The next element we saw is a pole at the origin. One over S. And for the pole at the origin, we saw that a pole at the origin will create a slope of negative 20 decibels per decade passing at zero dB at one radians per second. Why at one? Because 20 log of one is zero. So let's look at the frequency graph here. We have 0 0.01, which is 10 to the power of negative two. Here we have 10 to the power of negative one, that's 0 0.1. There we have 10 to the power of zero, that's one. And there we have 10 to the power of one, which is 10. We know that this thing has to pass at zero decibels at one radians per second. So assuming, knowing that this creates a slope of negative 20 decibels per decade, what, happened, what is the magnitude we should expect at 10 radians per second? If at one radians per second, zero, one radians per second, we are at zero, at 10 radians per second, what is the magnitude? What is the magnitude? Is negative 20, because we increase the frequency by a factor of 10. So the magnitude has to decrease by a factor of 20. What would be the magnitude at 0 0.1 radians per second? We are now decreasing the frequency by a factor of 10. 20, exactly. At 10 to the power of negative one, negative 20. And at 10 to the power of negative two or 0 0.01, the magnitude is 40, exactly. And this results in a, another slope here. And this slope, and we will notice every time the frequency increases by a factor of 10, the slope goes down by a factor of 20. A constant slope throughout the entire body plot. Okay. Now, what do we do? This is the body plot of each individual block, but we know that if you, we can simply add them up at this point because the log property. So, the body plot of the entire transfer function is the sum of these two curves. So what is the magnitude at, uh, let me do this in green to avoid confusion. What is the magnitude of the transfer of the body plot at the first tick there, 0 0.01? Is the magnitude, the sum of their magnitudes, so we're adding 20 to 40, that's 60. Just adding everything together, that's 60. What is the magnitude of negative one, 10 to the power of negative one? It's 20 plus, uh, 20 plus 20, that's 40. So we are up here. At 10 to the power of zero, we have zero plus 20, that's 20. And the 10 to the power of one, we have negative 20 plus zero. Uh, sorry, negative 20 plus 20, that's zero. So we go there and the result is the green line, which is, now you can see, it's kind of obvious, it's just shifted up by plus 20. Just the blue line shifted upwards by 20 decibels throughout. And the green, uh, green line is the magnitude of G of S as a function of frequency. 
what is the phase of this transfer of this the system? Well, the phase we have to add now the phase of the zero, sorry, the phase of the constant gain 10, which is zero, and the phase of the pole at the origin. The phase of a pole at the origin is always negative 90 degrees. So you have negative 90 degrees plus zero. That's negative 90 degrees for all frequencies. Okay. Any questions here? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So for the phase, we need to consider the phase of all individual building blocks and then add everything up. So we have two building blocks. We have the constant gain will come from here. The constant gain has a phase of zero. And to the phase of zero from the constant gain, we need to add the phase of the pole at the origin. And the phase of the pole at the origin, and as we saw here, is negative 90 degrees. So zero plus negative 90 is negative 90 degrees. The phase of the entire system is negative 90 degrees for all frequencies. Yep. Any questions? Nope. Should we continue? Yeah, all good? Sure. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the Next building block. Next building block is a pole on the real axis. So you have a, a real pole. It's no longer at the origin. It's on the real axis. And to anything that would give a pole on the real axis, we could write in this format. The problem with this is that uh, there are two elements here. The gain is hidden. There is a constant gain and there is a pole on the real axis. So to avoid that, we're always going to normalize this and write in this new standard form, one over S divided by omega zero plus one. So if you calculate the final value of this function is one, it doesn't affect the magnitude in the output. It's just a unit gain. This way we can split, we can uh, separate Constant gains and poles at the origin. That's where why you're going to use this formulation. So omega zero is a constant, is part of the system itself. It's part of the system, is, a, uh, is in, inherent to the system. And it's just a constant. And S equals to J omega, we can replace that in S, and then this omega is the omega that you are going to vary from close to zero to infinity. And omega zero is intrinsic to the system itself. So we now need to find the real and imaginary part, comp uh, component of the transfer function. So I can use equation eight. Remember this from last lecture, you just take the transfer function, multiply that by its complex conjugate. This way the denominator now becomes real and we can split the real and imaginary parts. So if we further, if you multiply out equation eight, we get equation nine. So from equation nine, then you can clearly see the real and imaginary components of the transfer function as we did in the last lecture. Now we can take the square root of the sum of the squares to find the magnitude. After some simple manipulation, this is just basic math. You can try this on your own later uh, as a good practice. 
but I will skip the simplification steps. I just want you to focus on the main big picture here. You know what we are, we are doing, finding the real part, the imaginary part, and through that, calculate the magnitude. This is what we should, should get. as the magnitude of the transfer function. Now, if we are dealing with a log scale, we can take 20 log of that. The square root now becomes negative one half. And we can move the negative to the front of the equation. And that's the final result. So I'm going over the steps here fast, but you get the idea. I don't need to go through all the simplifications. This is the same, same procedure we used before. Real part of square plus imaginary part of square, square root of that, but now you're taking 20 log of it, and that's the result. If you go back here, we see the imaginary and the real part. We can now calculate the phase. So the phase is the inverse tangent of the imaginary divided by the real, and that's the last equation here. Again, that is simplifies, and the simplified value is here. So here we have all we need, the phase and the magnitude. The magnitude is in decibels. Now, there's something interesting here. We have a phase and frequency, a phase and the magnitude that depend on the frequency, but it also depend on that omega zero. And omega zero is, again, intrinsic to the system is a parameter of the transfer function that characterizes the system itself. Now, this gets a bit more complicated. We need to analyze three cases. We need to analyze three cases because the result now depends on the ratio between omega, which is the frequency we are varying from zero to infinity, and omega zero, which is fixed, is a constant of the system. So let's do all these three cases slowly. So case one, is when the frequency of excitation to the system is much smaller than omega zero. The frequency of excitation to the system is much smaller than omega zero. You're going to call this omega zero the cutoff frequency. Cutoff frequency, which is the frequency of the system in uh, where this slope is will start to change. So if that is the case, if omega is indeed much smaller than omega zero, then this is approximately zero, right? Omega is very small, divided by omega zero, which is much larger than that, gives zero. So we are left with negative 20 log of square root of one, which is zero, which is zero. If you look at the phase, we have this here is tending to zero. Inverse tangent of zero is zero. So in case one, as the frequency, if the frequency is much smaller than the frequency omega zero, then the cutoff frequency, the phase of the body plot is zero. The magnitude of the body plot is also zero. Now let's look at the other extreme. Let's jump to case three and then you come back to case two. Now let's assume that for case three, we passed the cutoff frequency. Now we are exciting the system with a much higher frequency than its cutoff frequency, than omega zero. And what happens? Well, now omega is much greater than omega zero. So omega squared plus one is approximately omega squared divided by omega zero squared. One is much smaller than that funk ratio. Now we can neglect it and you can simplify this to simply, uh, by, by simply neglecting one. And if you're neglecting that a number one, this becomes square root of omega squared divided by omega zero squared, which is omega divided by omega zero. And we are taking 20 log of that. So the result here is tw negative 20 log of it. 
What does that give us? Well, let's think about it. Omega zero is fixed. It's a, it's a property of the system. If omega is equal to omega zero, what is the result? If omega is equal to omega zero, what is the magnitude? Is? Is? If omega equals to omega zero, the ratio is one. 20 log of one is zero. If omega equals to 10 omega zero, what happens? What is the result? We have 10 omega zero divided by omega zero. That's 10. Negative 20 log of 10 is negative 20. If we go at 100 omega zero, we get negative 40. If you go at 1000, we get negative 60. If you go at 10,000, negative 80, and so on. So what is happening? Every time we pass the cutoff frequency by a factor of 10, the Bode plot decreases by a factor of 20 decibels. Every time we pass the cutoff frequency by a factor of 10, the Bode plot decreases by a factor of 20. So we can identify two portions of the Bode plot now. We need to first identify the cutoff frequency, which in this case we call omega zero, up to omega zero, no changes in the, in the magnitude, it's zero. But now past the cutoff frequency, for every increase of 10 in frequency, the Bode plot decreases by 20. So when you are at 10 times omega zero, we get negative 20. 100, negative 40, 1,000, we get negative 60. Okay, so up to the body, uh, up to the cutoff frequency, it behaves exactly like a gain. It's just zero. Past the cutoff frequency, the body plot starts to decay by negative 20 decibels per decade. What happens at, for the phase for that portion? Well, if the phase now is the phase of omega divided by omega zero. Omega is much greater than omega zero, so that's a very large number. And the phase then tends to negative 90 degrees. So you have for the phase two portions as well. Before the cutoff frequency, the phase is zero. And past the cutoff frequency, the phase is negative 90 degrees. And there is the, uh, and then we have the case we skipped. That's case number two. What happens at the cutoff frequency? Well, that's easy. We can simply replace omega zero, omega with omega zero. Omega divided by omega zero is one. So one plus one is two, is square root of two, negative 20 log of two is negative three dB. So this comes from here by again, equating omega equals to omega zero. So exactly at the cutoff frequency, the Bode plot is at negative three dB. And what happens to the phase? Well, the inverse tangent of negative one here, is negative 45 degrees. So at the cutoff frequency, the body plot will pass by negative 45 degrees. We can now interpolate this. It's not a, a curve that is sharp like that. It's going to be a smooth transition. And at the cutoff frequency, we pass at negative 45 degrees. So three things to consider before the cutoff frequency. The gain is zero, the phase is zero. At the cutoff frequency, the gain is negative three decibels. The phase is negative 45 degrees. Past the cutoff frequency, the gain now decreases by a factor of 20 decibels per decade. And the magnitude of the phase tends to negative 90, or the phase tends to negative 90 degrees.
Any questions here? Any questions here? No? Will probably make more sense with an example. Sure, no questions. Okay. Let's do this exercise. Let's go back to what we started with. And let's now do the body plot of that thing. In input here is a force, output is a speed. And we want to do the body plot of the system for a range of frequencies. We have a mass of one kilogram and the coefficient of viscous friction of 0 0.1. So here is the three body diagram. I think I, I at this point uh, can skip it to find transfer function between the input and output. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll skip it. I'll just give you the, the transfer function and you, I'll post the solution with the, the full uh, version, but a V of S divided by F of S is one over MS plus B. We have M equals to one and B equals to 0 0.1. So this is called this G of S equals to one over S plus 0 0.1. Now we need to write this in the standard form we just established. And the standard form requires the denominator to be written as S over omega zero plus one. So how we do that, we can factor out 0 0.1. And this gives one over S divided by 0 0.1 plus one. I multiply it back, you go to the original function. And then you can further write this as 10 over S over 0 0.1 plus 1. Same functions, but now written in the format we need for analysis. And based on this function, what elements or body plot building elements can we identify? a pole on the real axis and in a constant gain. Very good, in a constant gain. A pole on the real axis, which has a cutoff frequency of 0 0.1 radians per second yeah, and a real gain of 10. Now let's try. So let me just rewrite you here. 10 over S over 0 0.1 plus 1. So a constant gain and a pull at the origin. For our frequencies, let's uh, do 0 0.1 or 10 to the power of negative one. Let's do 0 0.01 or 10 to the power of negative two. And let's do one or 10 to the power of zero. Between them, we have a factor of 10. A factor of 10. So pole of the origin, a pole uh, on the real axis and a constant gain. So for the constant gain, which is 10, you can simply do 20 log of 10. And that is 20. So that adds a slope, uh, adds a curve of 20. And a phase of, what's the phase? What is the phase for the constant gain? 
zero. For the positive constant gain, that's zero. So I'm going, not going to write that. It's zero. And now we have a pole at the origin. The pole at the origin is 0 0.1 plus one. So the cutoff frequency omega zero is 0 0.1. And let me uh, highlight it here. We saw that for the pole at the origin up to the cutoff frequency, the magnitude was zero. Cutoff frequency is 0 0.1, so up to 0 0.1, the magnitude is zero. Let me use another color here. At the cutoff frequency, the magnitude is negative three. I'm going, I'm going to neglect that for now, just uh, omit it. For now, let's assume it's zero. But past the cutoff frequency, now the body plot will decay by a factor of negative 20 decibels whenever the frequency increases by a factor of 10. So if at 0 0.1 radians per second, we have the cutoff frequency, we have a gain of zero. What is the magnitude at one radians per second? What is the magnitude at one radians per second? Negative 20, very good, negative 20, because between 0 0.1 and one, there's a factor of 10 in frequency, the Bode plot has to go down by negative 20 dB. And what is the body plot of the whole thing? Body plot of the whole thing is just the addition of these two. So the addition of these two, we can see that the purple line just shifts upwards by 20. Right? It just shifts upwards by 20. So here we should see something. That goes from 20. And then like that. So the, the, per, the green line is the entire transfer function. Now I neglected that a famous negative 3 dB that occurs at the cutoff frequency. So if we were to account for that, then at 0 0.1, we would have that a negative 3 dB that we omitted from the solution. So instead of 20, we should actually be at negative uh, plus 17. At, at zero, instead of zero, we should be at a negative three. And because of that negative three dB that occurred at the cutoff frequency. We are not going to use it. We can neglect it for now. This body plot is anyways an approximation of the actual function. So for simplicity, we are going to omit this negative three dB at the cutoff frequency, but be aware that it exists. So if you compare your solutions with uh, solutions from MATLAB, they are not going to match exactly. One of the reasons is because of this negative 3 dB, uh, we're going to omit that. If you want to use MATLAB to check your solutions, nothing simpler than just typing Bode G and it'll give you the Bode plot. Okay, so that's for the magnitude. What happens to the phase? Well, the phase is zero for the real part, for, for the constant gain. But now the pole, we have a pole that has a magnitude uh, cutoff frequency of 0 0.1. So the phase should go, you stay at zero up to the cutoff frequency. It should pass by negative 45 at the cutoff frequency and then tend to negative 90. So when we interpolate, actually, this is a bit misleading. Let me do, use the green color. That's the phase of the transfer function. Okay. So th this 
way of solving the body plots, probably you're going to see it in, in uh, textbooks. You want to do the body plot of individual elements and ev add everything up and so on. But let's uh, see another way. Are there any questions here before we move on? No? So just want to show you a quicker way to do this because, well, this analysis is, is easy when you have like one pole, two poles and so on. But if you have a very large transfer function, it might be impractical to have like five lines and then add everything up. That will take forever. So instead, let's look at a different method. Quicker method. Can I erase this? Yeah. Look at a quicker method to do this. So the frequencies are still the same. 0 .0 0.01, 0.1, 0 .1, and 1. And let's, oh, the, the phase doesn't change. The phase is what we just calculated. It's just a, a, a pole, no real axis. And the function we are dealing with is 10 over S times 0 0.1 plus 1. So whenever we have a function like this, let's think it this way. Let's just start at the lowest frequency range. What is the lowest possible frequency we can get? Well, 0 0.01. When we are at 0 0.01, we haven't reached any pole. The pole will only affect that when we pass it. After we pass the pole, that's where the pole starts to affect the body plot. Before the cutoff frequency of the pole, we, it doesn't do anything, it's zero. So if you go to the very low frequency range, or what is left here? What is affecting the body plot at that frequency range? It's only the constant gain 10. Nothing else is affecting the body plot because we haven't encountered the pole yet. So at the very low frequency, the only thing affecting the body plot is 10. So 20 log of 10 is 20. And the body plot will have to remain at 20 as we increase the frequency up to the point where we encounter the first pole. And that happens at 0 0.1 radians per second. And then from this point on, what happens to the slope? Well, the slope was zero, but now because you're crossing a pole, the pole will add negative 20 decibels per decade to the body plot. It doesn't make it negative 20 decibels per decade, it will add negative 20 decibels to whatever slope we had previously. Here it happens, so happens that we had zero and you're adding negative 20, right? But if we had the slope at this portion here that was negative 20 and we pass by a pole, then the slope becomes negative 40. Right? But at this point here, we had a slope of zero decibels per decade. We pass the pole, the pole adds negative 20 decibels per decade. So from this point on, whenever we increase the frequency by a factor of 10, the body plot goes down by negative 20. And as such, if we start from 20 and you have to go down by 20, we end up at 0 dB. Okay, And for the phase, it's the same story. The phase at low frequencies, we haven't reached a pole yet, is zero. Past the pole, we add negative 90. And I can just interpolate that. Okay. So that's a quicker way. You're going to come back to this in the next lecture, and you're going to complicate things a little bit more. Before I, I, I let you go, just a quick note here. What happens if you have a zero in the origin? You remember when you had a pole, uh, uh, sorry, a zero on the real axis and you had a pole and a zero on the origin? We had exactly the same body plot, but they were flipped with a sign change. Well, same will happen here. If you have a zero on the real axis, we have exactly the same as the pole, but everything shifts. If we had a slope of plus 20, negative 20 dB, now the, the slope past the cutoff frequency is plus 20 dB. The phase there went from zero, uh, zero to negative 90. Now it goes from zero to plus 90 degrees. Here is a comparison of two different functions. 
the blue is a pole at the origin and the purple or uh, whatever uh, that color is, uh, red, is the zero. We see that is exactly the same, but a one is, goes positive, the other one goes negative. Okay, so we'll do more exercises in the next lecture. I, I do have a few exercises that I want you to do in this lecture here. I'll pose the solutions to some of them, but do attempt these ones on your own before the next lecture. It will make a lot more sense that way.